Hey guys, it's me and class has just started up at my university and we were in English class today and I discovered that this book, Two Days of Mori, is required in my English class. And I was very, very pleased when I found this out because I absolutely adore this book. But what I was shocked to find out was a lot of people that I'm in school with have never read this. And it was required for me in my high school English class to read it. So, I'm going to read the first two short chapters, and then next week, I will read the next chapter, and hopefully you guys like it, because I know I do. curriculum. The last class of my old professor's life took place once a week in his house, by a window in the study where he could watch all his assistant plants shed its pink leaf. The class went on Tuesday and began after breakfast. The subject was the meaning of life. It was top next week. No grades were given, but there were oral exams each week. You were expected to respond to questions, and you were expected to pose questions of your own. You were also required to perform physical tasks now and then, such as lifting the professor's head to a comfortable spot on the pillow, or placing his glasses on the verge of his mouth, tripping him with a sigh or into extra credit. No books were required, yet many topics were covered, including love, work, community, family, aging, forgiveness, and finally, death. The last lecture was brief, only a few words. A funeral was held in lieu of graduation. Although no final exam was given, you were expected to, pr produ to produce one long paper on what was done. That paper is presented here. The class of my old professor's life had only one student. I was a student. It is the late spring of 1979, a hot, sticky Saturday afternoon. Hundreds of us sit together side by side in rows of wooden folding chairs on the main campus lawn. We were blue nylon rugs. We listen impatiently to long speeches. When the ceremony is over, we throw our caps in the air and we are officially graduated from college. New class of Brandeis University in the city of Waltham, Massachusetts. For many of us, the curtain of childhood is just closed. Afterward, I find Maury Schwartz, my favorite professor, and introduce him to my parents. He is a small man who takes that small steps, as if a strong wind could at any time whisk him up into the clouds. In his graduation day robe, he looks like, cro he looks like a cross between a, bi a biblical prophet and a Christmas elf. He has sparkling blue green eyes, thinning silver hair that spills onto his forehead, big ears, a triangular nose, and tufts of graying eyebrows. Although his teeth are crooked and his lower ones are slanted back as if someone had punched him in, and he smiled as if he told him the first joke on earth. He tells my parents how I took every class he taught. He tells them he has a special boy there. Embarrassed, I look at my feet. Before we leave, I hand my professor a present, a tan briefcase with his initials in front. I bought this the day before sh the day before I was shopping. I didn't want to forget him. Maybe I didn't want him to forget me. Mitch, you're one of the good ones, he says, admiring the briefcase, and he hugs me. I feel his thin arms around my back. I am taller than he is. And when he holds me, I feel awkward, older, as if I were the parent and he were the child. He asks if I would stay in touch, and without hesitation I say, of course. When he steps back, I see that he's crying. The syllabus. His death sentence came in the summer of 1994. Looking back, warning something bad was coming long before that. He knew it the day he gave up dancing. He'd always been a dancer, my old professor. Music didn't matter. Rock and roll, big band, the blues, he loved them all. He would close his eyes and with a blissful smile, begin to move to his own sense of rhythm. It wasn't always pretty, but then he didn't worry about his partner, or he danced by himself. He used to go to the church or Harvard Square every Wednesday night for something called Dance Free. They had flashing lights and booming speakers, and Maury would wander in, in among the most of the student crowd, wearing a white t-shirt and black sweatpants, and a towel around his neck. And whatever music was playing, that's the music to which he danced. 
He'd do the Lindy to Jimi Hendrix. He twisted and twirled. He waved his arms like a conductor on amphetamines until sweat was dripping down the middle of his back. No one there knew he was a prominent doctor of sociology with years of experience as a college professor in several well-respected books. They just thought he was an old knight. Once he brought a tango tape and got them to play it over the speakers. Then he commandeered the dance floor, shooting back and forth like some hot Latin lover. When he finished, everyone applauded. He could have stayed in, the mo- in that moment forever. But then the dance stopped. He developed asthma in his 60s. His breathing became labored. One day he was walking along with the Charles River, and a cold burst of wind left him choking for air. He was rushed to the hospital and injected with some A few years later, he began to have trouble walking at a birthday party for a friend. He stumbled inexplicably. Another night, he fell down the steps of the theater, startling a small group crowd of people. Give him air! Someone yelled. He was in his 70s by this point, so they whispered, and helped him to his feet. But Maury, who always was more in touch with his insights than the rest of us, and something else was wrong. This was more than his old age. He was weary all the time. He had trouble sleeping. He dreamt he was dying. He began to see doctors, lots of them. They tested his blood, they tested his urine, they put a scope up his rear end and looked inside his intestines. Finally, when nothing could be found, one doctor ordered a muscle biopsy. Taking a small piece out of Maury's calf, the lab report came back suggesting a neurological problem. And Maury was brought in for yet another series of tests. In one of those tests, he sat in a special seat as they zapped him with electric current an electric chair sir, and studied his neurological responses. We need to check this further, the doctor said, looking at his results. Why? Maury asked. What is it? We're not sure. The times are slow. The times are slow? What does that mean? Finally, on a hot, humid day in August 1994, Maury and his wife Charlotte went to the neurologist, neurologist's office, and he asked them to sit down before the before book news. Maury had amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a brutal, unforgiving illness of the neurological system. There was no known cure. How did I get it? Maury asked. Nobody knew. Is it terminal? Yes. So I'm going to die. Yes, you are, the doctor said. I'm very sorry. He sat with Maury and Charlotte for nearly two hours, patiently an- answering their questions. When they left, the doctor gave them some information on, LA- on ALS. Little pamphlets as if they were opening a bank account. Outside, the sun was shining, and people were going about their business. A woman ran to put money in the mar- parking meter. Another carried groceries. Charlotte had a million thoughts running through her mind. How much time do we have left? How will we manage? How will we pay the bills? My old professor, meanwhile, was stunned by the normalcy of the day around him. Shouldn't the world stop, unless I know what has happened to me? But the world did not stop. It took no notice at all. And as Maury pulled weakly on the car door, he felt as if he were dropping into a hole. Now what? He thought. As my old professor searched for answers, the disease took him over, day by day, week by week. He backed the car out of the garage one morning and could barely push the brakes. That was the end of his driving. He kept tripping, so he purchased a cane. That was the end of his walking free. He went for his regular swim at the YMCA, but found he could no longer undress himself, so he hired his first home care worker, a theology student named Tony, who helped him in and out of the pool, in and out of his bathing suit. In the locker room, the other swimmers pretended not to stare. They stared anyhow. That was the end of his privacy. In the fall of 1994, Maury came to the Hilly Brandeis campus to teach his final college course. He could have skipped this, of course. The university would have understood. Why suffer in front of so many people? Stay at home. Get your affairs in order. But the idea of quitting did not occur to Maury. Instead, he hobbled into the classroom, his home for more than 30 years. Because of cane, he took a while to reach the chair. Finally, he sat down dropped his glasses off his nose and looked out at the young face as he stared back in silence. My friends, I assume you're all here for the social psychology class. I've been teaching this course for 20 years, and this is the first time I can say there is a risk in taking it because I have a fatal illness. 
I may not live to finish the semester. If you feel this is a problem, I understand if you wish to drop the course. He smiled, and that was the end of the secret. ALS is like a lit candle. It melts your nerves and leaves your body with oil wax. Often it begins with the legs and works its way and works its way up. You lose control of your thigh muscles so that you cannot support yourself standing. You lose control of your trunk muscles so that you cannot sit up straight. By the end, if you are still alive, you are breathing through a tube and a hole in your throat, while your soul, perfectly awake, is imprisoned inside a limp pus, perhaps able to blink or fuck a tongue, like something from a science fiction movie, a man frozen inside his own flesh. This takes no more than five years from the day you contract the disease, or his doctors guess you at two years left. More I knew it was left. But my old professor had made a profound decision. Once he began to construct the day he came out of the doctor's office with a sword hanging over his head. Do I wither up and disappear, or do I make the best of my time left? He had asked himself. He would not wither. He would not be ashamed of his time. Instead, he would make death his final practice. The center point of his day. Since everyone was going to die, he could be of great value, right? He could be research. A human textbook. Study me in my slow and patient demise. Watch what happens. Learn with me. Mori would walk to that final bridge between life and death and the right the trust. The fall semester passed quickly. The pills increased. Therapy became a regular routine. Nurses came to his house to work with Mori's withering legs to keep the muscles active, bending them back and forth as if pumping water from a well. Massage specialists came by once a week to try to soothe the constant heavy stiffness he felt. He met with meditation teachers and closed his eyes and narrowed his box and took his full trunk down to a single breath, in and out, in and out. One day, using his cane, he stepped onto the curb and fell over into the street. The cane was exchanged for a walker. As his body weakened, the back and forth to the bathroom became too exhausting, so Moore began to urinate into a large beaker. He had to support himself as he did this, meaning someone had to hold the beaker while Maury filled it. Most of us would be embarrassed by all this, especially at Maury's age, but Maury was not like most of us. When some of his close colleagues would visit, he'd say to them, listen, I have to pee, would you mind helping? Are you okay with that? Often to their surprise, they weren't. In fact, he entertained a growing stream of visitors. He had discussion groups about dying, what it really meant, how societies had always been afraid of it without necessarily understanding it. He told his friends that if they really wanted to help him, they would treat him not with sympathy, but with visits, phone calls, a sharing of their problems the way they had always shared their problems, because Maury had always been a wonderful listener. For all that was happening to him, his voice was strong and inviting, and his mind was vibrating with a million thoughts. He was intent on proving that the word dying is not synonymous with useless. The new year came and went. Although he never said it to anyone, Maury knew this would be the last year of his life. He was using a wheelchair now, and he was fighting time to say all the things he wanted to say to all the people he loved. When a colleague at Brandeis died suddenly of a heart attack, Maury went to his funeral. He came home depressed. What a waste, he said. All those people saying all those wonderful things, and Irv never got to hear any of it. Maury had a better idea. He made some calls, he took a day. On a cold Sunday afternoon, he was joined in his home by a, li- by a small group of friends and a family for a living funeral. Each of them spoke and paid tribute to my old professor. Some cried, some laughed. One, one, one woman read a poem. My dear and loving cousin, your ageless heart, as you move through time, layer on layer, tender support. Maury cried and laughed with them, and all the heartfelt things we never get to say to those we love, Maury said that day. His living funeral was a rousing success. Only Maury wasn't dead yet. In fact, the most unusual part of his life is about to so That was the curriculum in the syllabus of Jesus with Maury. If you tune in next week, I will be starting on the student and get through to the audio visual. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you tune in next week.